Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Dave. I'm an alcoholic. Um, my sobriety date is August 12th, uh, 2010. Uh, my home group is Queen Anne's Study, which meets Sunday night at uh, 7 o'clock. And uh, I have a sponsor, and my sponsor has a sponsor. Um, I got sober in Atlanta um, four and a half years ago, and I am so grateful um, to this program because if it wasn't for this program and getting sober, uh, I wouldn't have been able to move to Seattle. There's no way I would have been able to pick up my life and move all the way across the country um, for an opportunity that was given to me. Um, and I, I'm just really grateful for that. I'm going to start by reading um, a little bit from the book. This is on page 52. And to a T, this describes my alcoholic uh, life before I got in this program. Um, and I have it written in, in my book here as the agnostic promises. Um, <laughs> We were having trouble with personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional natures. We were a prey to misery and depression. We couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of real help to other people. Um, and that's where alcohol took me. Um, I had a fairly, fairly high bottom. Um, I still had a house. I still had a job. Fence, dog in the backyard, car in the garage. Um, but I was emotionally destroyed. Um, I was a daily drinker. The first thing I did every morning was take a drink. Uh, no matter how many times I promised myself as I went to bed the night before that this was my last day of drinking, I was going to get up and go to work without drinking. I'd be halfway to the drink before realizing what was going on, and I'd still keep going. Um, despite driving drunk, many, many times, and as I said, I was a daily drinker at the end, and I was also a daily driver. Um, I never got pulled over. Um, when I did for speeding or running a red light or a stop sign, I would get that ticket and not the DUI. Um, and I don't know how that happened. Um, it wasn't me. I drank every day, drove every day and endangered lives around me every day. And it was my higher power working my life before I realized that there was a higher power. Um, I was raised in a fairly normal household. Um, no alcoholics in my life, as, as far as I know. Um, my dad and mom both drank, but had a beer while grilling. Um, and then that was all. Um, I don't relate to that. Um, I, I don't think I related to that after I had my first drink. Um, and I love my parents. I love my family. They're amazing people. Um, but for that connection, I don't have it with them. I have it with people in this room. Um, and coming to meetings and sharing my story like I'm able to tonight uh, gives me that connection that I really, really wanted um, growing up and, and in my alcoholic drinking days. Um, there's a, a picture that I actually have in my book um, of me at two and a half years old reaching for a full beer, and my dad's hand is coming into the picture to take it away from me. Um, and after my grandmother passed away, I was sober six months probably, um, when she passed away, we were cleaning out her house, and I found that picture in one of her picture books. Um, and I took it and put it in my book to remind myself, like, from a very young age, that's what I wanted. Um, I didn't even know what alcohol was at that point, but that's what I wanted. Um, my first real drink was in college, and it was I drank it alcoholically. I, I hold myself up in my dorm room. My roommate had the beer. He was out of town. I stole it from him and drank it alone. Um, 
And that from that point on, that's that's how I like to drink. I like to drink where other people wouldn't get in my way. Um, I would drink before going to the parties. And then whenever I noticed that everyone was away from the alcohol, they were hanging out in the living room or outside, and i count the people and make sure there was no one missing, I'd bolt <laughs> off to the kitchen and chug right from the bottle. Um, because all I wanted was the alcohol. That, that's all I thirsted for. Um, and I was willing to get rid of all of my other um, loves and my, my friendships and everything as long as I had the alcohol. And if the people didn't get in the way of my drinking, then I'd let them stick around. Um, and that was all. Um, I, I was able to, through drinking heavily, um, build up some semblance of a normal life. Um, I got married. I had a job. I was working hard enough to not lose it, but really not very hard at all. Um, I would go home at lunch and drink more and then go back to work and flask at work. Um, it was a miserable lifestyle. Um, like I said, the, the real legal and health consequences didn't catch up to me while I was drinking, but I was emotionally broken. I had no other drive in my life besides getting alcohol and drinking. Um, in 2010, I somehow realized that this was not the way I wanted to live. Um, my now ex-wife and I were talking about having kids, and I decided, you know, I, I couldn't bring another life into the world and care for it the way I would want to if I was drinking how I was drinking. And she had no idea how I was drinking. We drank together, but most of my sneaking around obviously sneaking around, I was drinking behind everyone's back. Um, and she left town for two weeks out of the country, and I decided this was the perfect time. I was going to stop drinking alcoholically during this time. <laughs> and by the time she got home, I might tell her what was going on, I might not. But either way, I'd be a normal drinker again. Um, and by day five or six, I realized I hadn't made any progress. Um, I was still drinking before leaving for work and drinking even more heavily because she wasn't around to, to kind of keep an eye on me. Um, and I checked myself into treatment the day she returned. Um, I admitted what was going on, checked myself into treatment, and almost immediately I realized, I realized it was false. Now I see that it was false. Um, that... I wasn't like the people who I was locked up in treatment with. Um, I didn't have all those consequences that they had that had either court ordered them to treatment or they had been handcuffed and brought there or whatever. And I thought, you know, maybe if I just dried out for this time that I was locked up, I could leave and go back to my normal drinking. But they also told me to go to AA. And so I went. Um, I went to my first AA meeting, and then they started talking about getting a sponsor. So I got a sponsor, and I started kind of working the steps with my sponsor, and then I started drinking again. But I knew I couldn't tell anybody. I told my, everybody in my life that I was an alcoholic, that I was going to stop drinking. And so now, not only could I not drink a little bit in front of people and hide all the rest of my drinking, I couldn't drink at all in public. And all of my drinking was in, in secret. Um, within six months, I was drinking every day. I was going to a meeting every day. I was talking to my sponsor every day. And nothing was getting better. Um, I was still miserable. I was seeing smiling faces in meetings and wondering why I wasn't getting it. Um, and I, I thought about this recently um, through, like, November and, and December, a lot of the meetings were about um, higher power working in your life. And I don't know what was different on August 10th from August 11th of 2010. Um, I got up that morning and I didn't take a drink before going to work. Um, I called my sponsor a couple hours into work and I told him, I've been drinking this whole time. 
I don't know what to do. I don't want to live this way anymore. And he said, go to a meeting. And that was all. I went to a meeting. Um, in Atlanta, they pass out chips at every single meeting, and the white chip is the 24-hour chip. And he said, go to a meeting and pick up a white chip. And I did. And then I admitted to the treatment center that I had been drinking that whole time. And then I admitted to my home group that I had been drinking that whole time. And everyone was just happy that I was finally being honest. Um, some people, I'm sure, was, were suspicious. Um, I don't know how many people were, but some people definitely came up and said, you know, I was, I was sitting in that speaker meeting with you that one time, and I leaned over and whispered that I thought I smelled whiskey and that somebody must have been drinking, and I could tell by your reaction that it was probably you. Um, I don't remember that. I know that I frequently flasked speaker meetings, and I frequently flasked other meetings that I went to, and so it was probably true. Um, when I finally put the alcohol down and started going to meetings and, and doing the steps properly, um, there isn't a right way to do the steps in my mind, but with alcohol in me, I wasn't able to even attempt them. Um, I could say I was. I could kind of go through the motions, but um, I was sitting on my couch, drinking, working on a fourth step, and writing down every name of every person in a meeting that I had been in. Um, and it was just never ending. Um, I could tell that it wasn't going to go anywhere. Um, so I finally stopped drinking. Um, and from that day until today, I haven't had a drink. I've, I've wanted to drink occasionally. Um, I've been lucky and blessed by a higher power enough that when I want a drink, one isn't right in front of me. Um, and that's, I, I keep myself in a, a safe, safe place. Um, I go places where there's alcohol, but I don't. I don't know. I, I keep myself in fit spiritual condition um, and through going to meetings and talking to people. Um, I like to read a couple more things that I, I love the, the promises in the book and what I started out with, what my life was before I quit drinking. And this is uh, on 83, the ninth step promises. If we are painstaking about this phase of our development, we will be amazed before we are halfway through. We are going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. We will not regret the past, nor wish to shut the door on it. We will comprehend the word serenity, and we will know peace. No matter how far down the scale we have gone, we will see how our experience can benefit others. That feeling of uselessness and self-pity will disappear. We will lose interest in selfish things and gain interest in our fellows. Self-seeking will slip away. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. Fear of people and of economic insecurity will leave us. We will intuitively know how to handle situations which used to baffle us. We will suddenly realize that God is doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. And then a little bit later, it's the 10th step promises. And we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol, for by this time sanity will have returned. We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. We react sanely and normally, and we will find that this has happened automatically. We will see that our new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. That is the miracle of it. We are not fighting it, neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we have been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. We are neither cocky nor are we afraid. That is our experience. That is how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. Um, and that's how I am most, most days now. Um, I feel safe. I feel protected. I know that the only, the only thing that can really just mess my life up is if I pick up a drink because of whatever's going on in my life. Um, when I was thinking about moving here, I was terrified. I was anxious and scared that it wasn't going to work out. And I, I heard in meetings and I, I picked up that, you know, no matter how bad Seattle was, no matter how bad my new job was, if I didn't meet people, if I didn't make friends, as long as I didn't drink, 
I could go back to Atlanta and I don't know, pick up the pieces and, and live life. Um, but that hasn't happened. Uh, I haven't picked up a drink, but I love it here. And I've gotten plugged into great meetings here. And AA isn't the same, um, but it's amazing here. I, I went back to my old home group the last time I was in Atlanta, and um, I didn't feel quite as home there as I did when I got sober there. I've gotten used to AA here, um, and I love it, and I'm going to keep coming back. So thanks for having me. I am Derek. I am an alcoholic. Derek. What am I supposed to say? Uh, my home group is Lake City Big Book. It's on Wednesday nights at 8 o'clock on uh, 145th and 19th Avenue Northeast, I believe. And uh, my sobriety date is March 30th, 2012. So, um, I guess I'm just going to read a little bit and then share where I'm at with all that. I read, um, we were having trouble with personal relationships, we couldn't control our emotional natures, we were a prey to misery and depression, we could not make a living, we had a feeling of uselessness, we were full of fear, we were unhappy, we couldn't seem to be of uh, real help to other people. Um, so basically, like... That's my life, just overall in general. Um, like, um, you know, I never really felt like all right with myself growing up, like, for starters, because I wasn't raised by my parents. I don't even know my uh, biological father. I was taken home from the hospital by my uh, grandfather and my grandma. And, uh, so that was, like, one huge thing that, like, made me feel a lot different than a lot of other people, right? And, like, you know, it was kind of hard growing up because I always wanted to, like, you know, at least know who my father was, you know, why I look half the way I look and stuff like that, right? <laughs> and, uh, st you know, I mean, like, it's kind of, uh weird growing up like that, you know, but after a while I just learned how to deal with it, I guess, um, but, uh, like, that made it difficult for me to have relationships with other people, um, you know, it was kind of depressing, um, and, uh, I guess, yeah, man, like, there were a lot of times where I was unhappy around holidays and stuff, like, um, or just, like, my whole life, really, you know? Like, I've played sports and stuff my whole life, and I'd show up to games, and everybody would have their parents there, and, like, I'd have nobody there, really, you know? Like, that's how I kind of grew up, but that was all right with me because, like, when I was playing sports, that was, like, the only time my mind and everything was, like, really just, like, all right. Like, I didn't have to think about anything, right? I just played, you know? And uh, getting a little bit older... Um, into my teens, right, like, I started getting really, like, serious about baseball and basketball, and, uh, I couldn't look forward to, like, or I could, I was really looking forward to playing for, uh, high school, right, and, like, trying to actually, like, take that next step and, like, try and step up and, like, make myself known, and, uh, like, Right before I graduated uh, eighth grade, I got in trouble for, uh, I guess, how do you put it, like really just experimenting with stuff that I probably shouldn't have been experimenting with, right, at a school dance. And, and right off the bat, I experienced consequences from this stuff, right, 14 years old, and I was almost not allowed to graduate eighth grade because of it. And, uh, you know, like right away, lying about it. No, I've never done that in my life, lying to my grandfather, right? I've never done that stuff. Like, I don't know what they're talking about. I don't know why they're trying to, like, screw me over, like, you know? <laughs> right off the bat, dude. And I've only used it a few times, right? Like, that was my justification to myself. Like, I've only done this a few times. How is this happening? <laughs> um, <laughs> why is this happening to me? Poor me, right? Just being a victim about it. Um, 
whatever. Like, they basically let me graduate. I, like, did a few things that they asked me to do, and uh, they let me graduate eighth grade. And, uh, like, that really didn't help me at all, you know, because, like, I had gotten away with something that I knew I did, and I lied and did everything I had to do to, like, get away with it, and, and it all ended up working out, I thought, at the time for the better, you know, because now I could, like, continue to use. I'm going into high school. I'm about to make more friends doing all this stuff. And uh, what basically ended up happening to me was uh, that, like, right when I entered my freshman year, uh, I started getting into worse trouble than I was before, right? And, like, uh, I started using a lot more. And uh, I didn't really think it was a problem, but a lot of my friends and stuff, like, st that's, like, when they started to stop wanting to be around me. Um... And I didn't even play any sports, right? I, like, tried out for freshman football, and they wanted me to be their quarterback. And I was like, I don't want to be the quarterback, dude. This sucks. You guys blow. I'm not trying to do this. I'm going to go drink. Um, and basically what ended up happening, right, was, like, I got in trouble my freshman year, and they sent me to an alternative school. And uh, I was like, well, <laughs> perfect, man. Look, like, everybody's just like me. They all want to get screwed up. They don't even want to go to school, man. Like, they give you a packet of homework, you do it. <laughs> and then it doesn't even matter if you show up or anything, really, like, as long as that homework's done. And uh, so basically, like, I had experienced a lot of consequences in a very short amount of time. And uh, the progression of this in my life was very rapid. Like, it all, you know, came together pretty fast. Like, uh, and I never really saw a problem with it, right? Like, um, I guess because probably I was raised around it. Like, that's why my mother was not eligible at the time to take me home from the hospital because she suffers from this too. And uh, so I guess when they say it runs in the family, like, it kind of does. Like, my, you know, I'm not supposed to diagnose people or whatever, but, I mean, it is what it is, you know. Like, she tells me she has an issue with it, and it's blatant to me, and I can see that she does. But she doesn't want help with it, so... Anyway, um, so basically, uh, where are we, freshman year, alternative school? So my high school, Ballard, let me come back to school, right? And, and I really wanted to, like, play sports my sophomore year, right? Like, started getting surrounded by good people again, but they didn't want anything to do with me. And, like, so I started surrounding myself with uh, other people, right? Because these people wanted nothing to do with me because of the way I was behaving and the things I was doing. Like, you know, I was not being a successful person at the time, you know? Um, and uh, whatever, right? Like, fast forward. Like, to 16, my grandfather died, and that's when shit, like, really, sorry for swearing, that's when things really, like, uh, took off for me, man. Like, I did not care about life anymore. 16 years old. Who's going to take care of me? Me. And that's where a lot of, like, this reading comes into play, right? And, like, why, I'd, like, at this point in my life, I probably wouldn't have been able to stop drinking if I really wanted to, but, like... This was, like, the perfect reason for me to not stop. You know, this was the perfect reason for me to do the exact opposite. This was the perfect reason for me to just completely ruin my life. Because the man that raised me was gone, and I had nothing else, and nothing even mattered to me anymore, right? And, uh, like... Like this thing says, right? Fear, unhappiness, uh, prey to misery and depression, like all these things that I was incapable of dealing with at the time, I feel like, in the right way, because of my drinking. Like, I didn't, I didn't deal with them. I didn't even try to. And, uh, and uh, you know, things just kept happening. And by the time I was, uh, well, right? Okay, I guess, the like, right after that, I... Uh, got into some pretty serious trouble and I didn't even know how serious it was basically what happened was like I woke up locked up one day and I didn't even know what I was doing right I'm like I think 17 a few months after he, uh my grandfather passed away right blacked out don't even know what I did locked up 
very young kid and uh, dealing with feelings of fear and unhappiness and stuff like that, like, right? Huge part of my story, um, depression. And then when I found out in court what I had actually, like, done, man, that just made me feel, like, even worse, right? And I just, all I wanted to do was get out and continue to get loaded because I didn't know anything else at that age or time in my life. And, uh, like, the judge tried to kind of help me, and, like, uh, they suggested that I went to meetings and stuff and whatever, and, like, things just weren't working out. So, uh, basically, like, they told me I had to go live with my parents, and my parents didn't, my mom and stepdad didn't, didn't want me around because they already knew what I was going through. So they uh, shipped me off to Utah to try and have me fixed by my step-parents' uh, family. And, uh, I mean, that only worked for, like, it didn't even work, right? Like, that lasted, like, <laughs> I lasted for, like, three months, right? They were trying to make me go to Mormon church and stuff, right? So this, this is, like, a huge part of my story because, like, growing up, I had a huge resentment towards God, like, after my grandpa passed away, right? I didn't want anything to do with God at all. Why would you do that to me, God? You don't do that to people especially if you care and love about them. And if you are real, even, you don't do that to people, right? Um, so, like, that really didn't work out right. And uh, I got sent back here, and, and out of fear or whatever, like, and all this stuff, basically out of fear, right? Like, when they sent me home on the plane, my, pa- my mom came and picked me up and was like, look, there's, like, two alternatives you have, like, because you're not going to stay with me and continue to get loaded. You can either uh, go into, like, a housing thing because I was only 17, or you can go to treatment. And this was the first time I had been introduced to, like, a inpatient, right? And I went and did the Lakeside Milan thing, sat in there for uh, 30-something days, and then uh, got out, right? And <laughs> nothing really even changed, but she let me come live with her. And at that time, I was only 18. I turned 18 in the treatment facility, right? And I thought, like, I was, like, really convinced about two weeks in that I was going to be the kid that made it until graduation day came. And then I was like, yeah, right, dude. You guys are crazy, (laughs) right? And uh, so anyways, fast forward. Like, that's basically what uh, my life looked like um, when I was loaded, right, in and out of the Salvation Army, I think I went down to that treatment facility like two times. The third time I went down there, they uh, actually had to turn me down um, because I went so many times in a short period of time, right? There's a lot of struggle to get sober and stay sober. Um, at one time, I did piece together 16 months and then, like, thought I didn't have a problem and went back out, and that was, like, in 2011 when I went back out. And... uh you know, like, things just continue to get worse, right? And out of fear and stuff, like, I actually reached out, man, and, like, got some help and uh, was doing the steps and got to a spot this time around where I thought, like, I was good again and put the steps down. And uh, I'd say about the, like, last year of my life is uh, where this, like, misery and depression came in, the feelings of uselessness, a whole lot of fear. I was very unhappy, right, because I wasn't working on myself. I wasn't building my conscious contact with God. wasn't even working on it. I basically just put this all to the side, and I just show up to meetings and stuff, right? And, uh, like, what happened was uh, I tried to control my life again. I wanted to be God. I wanted to be God again. I wanted a girl. I wanted a car. And I wanted life to start going the way I wanted it to. And, uh... Where that ended me up in was back in jail for a little while, and uh, I got out, and and for, uh, you know, basically all of 2013, or 14, all of 2014, I was dealing with, like, feelings of uselessness and stuff, right? Like, I had to rebuild my life completely, and it was, like, really depressing, and miserable, um, right, because I didn't want anybody around me, because I didn't trust anybody or whatever, you know, I had all sorts of reasons for everything I was doing, right, like, I didn't want people around me, I, uh, 
I really just wanted to die, right, without alcohol even in my life for a little while. That's where I had ended up. And uh, a gentleman reached out to me, and, uh, you know, I was in a spot where I was really, really ready to go back out again, right, because, like, my life had become, this thing's about to be, it's at five, four. <laughs> <laughs> Just his stop. All right, I'll try and wrap this up. I think I'm basically at the end, really. Um, so basically, like, uh, I ended up in jail because of some stuff I had ended up doing, right? Like old behaviors or whatever you want to call it. Like I was not really working on myself. I wanted to control my life and live it the way I wanted to live it, right? And I thought that, like, buying clothes and looking good all the time and stuff like that was what was going to make me happy. Like, my perception had switched, like, so quickly on me and I just ran with it right and it almost ended me up in trouble again and uh yeah like I said man just a lot of misery and depression and uh a whole lot of isolation and you know it's a whole lot of thinking which is not good to be thinking when you're in a situation like that for me at least um you know in uselessness man I just um, anyway, so a gentleman reached out to me at Lake City Big Book and asked me if I wanted to, uh, join their home group, dude, and, and, like I said, I only had two choices in my life at that time, and it was either, like, do something different and, like, actually fully commit myself to something, or go get loaded again, and, and I already knew what that life was all about, and I felt like I had been hanging on by a thread for, like, a little bit too long and I was really on my way out so I was just like yes what do I have to do what do you want me to do started doing that right and I asked that gentleman that same night to be my sponsor and uh he passed me off and I was like whatever I'll do the steps with this guy then <laughs> right because that's how broken I had come with even without alcohol in my life right I had found myself in a spot where I was completely broken and uh I bet essentially just ran out of answers for myself right and so here I am now, standing up here, because I didn't want to. And, uh, <laughs> and like, honestly, I tried to get out of it, like, a half an hour before the meeting started. <laughs> even though, like, three hours before, I was like, yeah, I'll be there. Don't even worry about it, dude. And uh, so now I'm just trying to put action into places where I uh, really haven't, right? And, like, completely just do this deal, because... Uh, Like, my, my life is a lot different, and it is a lot better to me than even when I don't have alcohol and I'm not working on stuff like this, you know? But, uh, yeah, I, w I wouldn't be where I'm at today without these steps, without the sponsorship I have, the uh, meetings and stuff, obviously, the fellowship, the rooms, and, uh, you know, my small support group and... Uh, I definitely wouldn't be here if it weren't for the God of my understanding. And that's all I have. Thank you. As mentioned previously. Hi, I'm Kirsten. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I'm nervous. Just getting that out there. Um, my sobriety date is 3412, and I'm keeping it because it's kind of cool. Um, my home group is Women's Way, which meets on Tuesday nights um, in Kirkland. And I have a sponsor, and I have a service position at that group, and I'd invite any of the women here to come over and hang out. It's a really cool meeting. Um, it's spiritual, but not weird, so there you have it. Um, so I've never done this, so here we go. What it was like, I uh, was born in Germany to, uh, to an American, and my dad was in the Navy, so automatically that means we moved around a lot. There was also, you know, some cultural tension in my home. And um, I, uh, but we had, you know, an average family, mom, dad, two girls, average house, a couple cars, you know, it's normal. But I always um, just kind of felt like something was missing. And I don't know where I got that programming or that messaging, but I just kind of felt alone, like something was missing, like is this all there was? Um, and I also kind of got some messaging that there was never enough. 
So we all worked really hard and but there was never enough and there were, we always needed to go for more. So that's kind of how I grew up. Um, and so, as I said, we moved around a lot. I was always guessing what was normal. I was always trying to fit in. It made me really adaptable, but also always felt like the outsider, kind of like the weirdo. We'd move, you know, from California back to Germany and like, what are they doing now? I have no idea. So I was just always guessing at, at what was going on and I was pretty lost as a kid. Um, until my mom got me a Seventeen magazine to help me fit into American culture, which, you know, was fine. I was about 16. And uh, slowly but surely, a year later, I had developed an eating disorder. And I know that's separate, but, you know, I had uh, some healthy anorexia for perfectionism and then some bulimia to kind of relieve some of that tension. And uh, so that was my first escape. And I mention that because, you know, that was my precursor. For alcoholism, but uh, the first taste of alcohol actually, well, I have to tell this story really quick. Um, so I grew up in Germany, and they had Kinder beer, so like beer for children. So it was, <laughs> which, you know, only in Germany. But so we'd sit around in my grandpa's garden after a hard days of work, and he'd grab his Heineken or whatever, and I'd grab, or his Pilsner, sorry, not Heineken. And he, and I would grab my Kinder beer, and my sister and I would just drink with him, and I just, you know, hated the taste. It was gross. But I just thought it was really funny, and that was like my first pseudo experience with alcohol. Fast forward to you know around 12, 13, when I we moved to California, and I uh, would sneak beers out to the boys, you know, the boys at the bus stop, my neighborhood boys, and you know they'd sit and drink. I'd watch them. I didn't really care for it. I had a sip. I didn't like it. So I, I wasn't one of those people who had a sip of alcohol, and I was just like, the kingdom came. I did not. Um, and so my first escape being bulimia, then I got into alcohol. Um, but then I also got into relationships. So my first boyfriend, when I was 17, he introduced me to Beyond Beer. So wine, champagne. He was in the restaurant industry, so there was also a lot of cocaine. Um, we'd drop acid and go hiking out in the Big Sur Mountains. Um, so some mushrooms here and there, but mostly, you know, booze and coke. And uh, I was very isolated. I was very isolated living on the top of a hill in California, away from others. My mom really wouldn't let me leave the house. So when I went to college, that all changed. Um, I found another guy who kind of introduced me to, it was in the mid-90s, so it was like the Burning Man time before it was kind of cheesy to go to Burning Man. It was like the real Burning Man crowd, so... <laughs> It was like, um, you know, ecstasy and more LSD and MDMA and ketamine and GHB and all this stuff. Like, basically anything that would make me feel different. I don't need to go into a whole laundry list, but anything that would make me feel different, um, I would do. And so to this day, when people tell me, you know, I'm going to lock my daughter up until she's, you know, 18 and, or 21, I'm like, don't do that. Don't lock your children up. And then send them <laughs> off to college, especially at USC, where... You know, bad things happen to good girls. Um, so the way I drank, I'll speed this up a little bit here. The way I drank, it was always to excess. I drank to pass out. I drank when I was happy. I drank when I was sad. I drank when I had a good day. I drank when I had a bad day. I had drank when I had an average day. I just drank to feel different. I did not like feelings. Happy, sad, glad. Nothing. Like, it would always be either enhanced, I can make it more, I could be more happy, I could be more excited about something, or not. So, um, the main through line is that whenever I started drinking, eventually I just couldn't stop. And then eventually also when I drank, I had no idea what would happen or how much I could handle. It could be like a pitcher of beer and I'd be fine, but then the next day I could have two glasses of wine and be just out. Um, I was a passer-outer and a puker. I loved to just drink for oblivion, just drink until I could get all the thoughts out of my mind and just hit the pillow and, and go to bed. I always found my own bed, which was good because <laughs> I know passing out in fraternities isn't smart. Um, I didn't know about that. Um, let's see. And yeah, so I can never control the outcome. Just a couple of drunky stories, and then I need to move it on. But uh, so the way I would drink is, um, you know, I would just be shopping at Hollywood and Vine, which is an L.A. shopping center, and I thought, oh, this is a great day. 
not a cloud in the sky. And I would sit uh, down at the, uh, the sushi restaurant and I would just taste randomly, just taste through all the sakis, like first the hot ones and then the cold ones. And I remember just being just <laughs> blacking out, but not really, I never really blacked out actually, but just being so wasted and the bartender pushing me into the elevator and pushing the, you know, parking button and just being like, bye, thanks for the tip, you know, and, you know, just vomiting all over myself and then driving home with one eye open so I could, like, barely see where I was going, but I made it home and then sleeping for two days. And then another time, maybe even two weeks later, when I told myself, of course, I would never do that again. Um, but two weeks later, I... Uh, I did one of those fasts that they did in the 90s where you just drink lemon water and cayenne pepper uh, for like 10 days straight. And I think I was on day three and I decided, oh, I'm not doing that anymore. I went to a party and I broke that fast with wine and Vicodin. I don't recommend that. Um, but that led me to my first true blackout drunk. Um, and it was not fun because I woke up in a crack house or a frat house. They're all kind of the same. And... Uh, <laughs> with people I didn't know, and it was just really awkward. So anyways, that's how I drank. I'm not going to go on and on, but I think some of us here can uh, relate. What finally brought me to the program, though, is I went on a bender two weeks before my wedding, and my fiancé at the time, who became my husband eventually, told me, you know, I, I can't marry you like this. And I was like, all right, well, I guess I'll do something. It was pretty bad that I stayed out until 4 o'clock in the morning and then snuck in, you know, two weeks before we're getting married not checking in, not letting him know where I was. So um, I went to AA. Uh, one of his co-workers' wives took me to AA, and I liked it. I mean, it was nice. Everybody was nice and keep coming back. And, you know, people had interesting things to say. And when they talked, I, like, listened. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I felt like that too. But I just didn't understand how, you know, these steps and this work and believing in God could really help me with my problem my insurmountable problems, my very special and unique problems, because, you know, that's what I am. It's just terminally unique in my own mind. Um, I just didn't know how this would help me. So I kept coming back, but I would kind of, you know, stay on the outskirts. I'd go to meetings, but I'd, you know, leave early. I would never call anybody. I would get numbers from everyone, but I would not call. Um, I obviously didn't get a sponsor, and I didn't work the steps, but, you know, I'd, I'd go to meetings, so I was doing AA, and I was staying reasonably sober, <laughs> but uh, I just was, uh, I was 27 at that time, and I realize now, looking back, I'm almost 40, um, that I was just for 10 years, so I, I do the 30, 60, 90 dance, right? I'd have 30 days, and I get really excited, and I'd feel good, and everything's great, my life is good, and I'd go back out, and then do that, and, you know, come back in, I can't believe I did that again, 60 days, 90 days, and do that over and over, and uh, I just didn't get it that when a speaker stood up here and said, well, this is what I did. I went to meetings, and I got a sponsor, and I worked the steps, and I talked to newcomers, and I have a service position. And I heard that over and over and over again for 10 years, and I just thought, oh, well, that's so great that it works for them, but I just don't know if I can do all that. I just don't know if that's going to work for me. And I was just so sick that I didn't realize that, you know, the whole idea of working this, this program thoroughly um, could actually work for me. I just didn't have um, that faith built up yet because I wasn't doing the work. It's like, you know, there's blind faith and then there's faith that you earn through or, you know, acquire through doing some work and getting through something hard and knowing that it's going to be okay. And I just never allowed myself that chance to take some action because I just didn't do anything. So um, long story longer... Um, <laughs> so I basically skimmed along the bottom in this program for 10 years, doing everything half-assed, as I just said, and, uh, I don't know, then I went through a divorce. Oh, by the way, I'd managed to get married and have two kids. Sorry, I left that part out. And I also, you know, kept advancing in my career, so I thought, you know, everything looked good on the outside. Everything's fine. Everything looks good on the outside. I'm making a lot of money. I have a husband. I have two children. Everything is great. And it just didn't get bad enough for me um, until it did. I got divorced. And, um, you know, I'd have like, you know, a year here, a couple months there. I didn't drink through any of my pregnancies, thank God. Um, 
So I had a little bit of sober time, but it was never really earned sober time, the way I look at it now. And uh, finally, during my divorce, instead of running to the program, which everybody said to do, they said, okay, you're going through something really hard. Go to more meetings. Talk to your sponsor more. Do more service work. I just figured I could do this on my own. I isolated and I drank. So my last drink was actually really wimpy. Um, I was at an event, a special event, um, kind of like a cocktail party. And instead of, you know, ordering myself a drink, I would just take sips off of other people's drinks. <laughs> oh, and I was like, oh, I'm not drinking because it's just a sip here and there. And so that was my embarrassing last drunk, which I just feel like I should be puking somewhere, but I, I didn't. Um, I did almost get on the wrong way turn to get back on 520 from Seattle, and that was my big wake-up call. Because I wasn't drunk, I was maybe a little buzzed, but I almost made that wrong turn, and that was for me, God going, okay, get back on the right road, like literally... Um, so what else? I'm sorry, these notes, I can't even read them anymore. Um, so what happened or what it's like now, I guess. So I came to the program after that silly relapse and I realized I've got to do this thing. I've got to do it thoroughly. So I got a sponsor and we actually worked the steps. And then I got another sponsor who's here tonight and we actually worked the steps in the big book. Um, we read the big book aloud to each other back and forth and we worked the steps thoroughly, very thoroughly. <laughs> and, um, because I wasn't at a point where I was like, I, I think I'm going to drink. I have to, you know, get through this really fast. I could take my time a little bit and I worked it thoroughly. And through that, um, for, through doing it that way, I really had a spiritual awakening. I don't know what happened. I don't know when it happened. I just know that it did happen. And I realized Yes, I'm an alcoholic. Yes, there is a power greater than me, thank God, because that's a lot of pressure to have everything be on your shoulders. And I finally figured out um, who I wanted my higher power to be, and that, yes, that God is my God, my higher power is big enough to handle all of my problems, every single one. And so over the last three and a half years, um, I do feel for the first time I've been working a really solid program, I hope, if that doesn't sound braggadocious, but I, uh, I just, uh, I, I, there's just been a change, and I can't explain it, um, and I'm just really grateful for this program, and grateful for all the women who stuck by me, even through all my silly relapsing, and, um, and today I have tools for living, tools that I can apply not only to, you know, not drinking, but to the rest of my life. I'm working on emotional sobriety right now. I'm still working on financial sobriety, which are the next two things I'm told after, you know, physical sobriety. And uh, I'm just, yeah, just really grateful to be here. And I have 36 seconds. So let's see. What else can I tell you? Um, <laughs> hold on. Maybe I have a really good story still. No. If you're new, I mean, keep coming back, but just stay. I mean, Drinks, and, or, you know, they're inventing new booze every day. There'll be something interesting out there later. Just stay for a little bit. Just wait. Hold on for that one more day. Use your tools, the tools of calling someone and um, uh, coming to meetings and uh, getting a sponsor. All that stuff that these silly speakers would tell me to do and was right in front of me the whole time when I actually did them. Um, this program gave me a life that I can't imagine. I'm a present mom. I'm a good employee. My mom and I are speaking again, which <laughs> is a miracle. And she comes to visit me, and I don't dread it. I look forward to it. I, uh, again, have a, a good job. And the, actually, the career of my dreams, as soon as I turned it over to my higher power in the third step, and I worked the, to, uh, I worked the steps on my job, too. So anyway, life is awesome because of this program. And thanks for letting me speak. And thanks for getting through this very first ever Speak, speaker meeting of mine. Holy shit. So I thought I was off the hook for a second. But, uh, so my name is Nick. I'm an alcoholic. I'm grateful to be alive, sober, net meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous today. It's really good to be here with you guys. Um, so my sobriety date is September the 4th, 2011. My home group is uh, Four Horsemen. Uh, and I think that's all that I'm required to say at the beginning of this. So I'll just go into it. So I'm um, here to talk about, you know, what it was like, what happened, and what it's like now. And what it was like is uh, 
Oh, I mean, it wasn't good in brief. That's what, what it was like. But um, in general, you know, I didn't start out as a kid who took his first drink at 12. I was a pretty good student. I was a pretty good uh, member of my household and community. I feel like I really did my t chores on time and did all that kind of stuff and tried to help my brother out. And I actually really didn't think I ever really wanted to drink or drug. I thought that that wasn't going to be a part of my life. Um, but uh, as these things tend to go, I had a group of friends, and you know, one night they decided that they wanted to go to one of my friends' houses and raid their parents' liquor cabinets, and I joined in on that. And um, you know, that first experience for me wasn't this like, oh my God, this is the answer to all my problems. It was me getting drunk and then crying for the rest of the night um, and waking up the next morning saying that next time was going to be different. And that was pretty much how my drinking went for the rest of my drinking. You know, it was every night, you know, some nights were better than others. But uh, I, you know, I would inevitably wake up the next morning being like, okay, next time is going to be different, though, because I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that or I'm not going to call this person or I am going to call this person or, you know. And so through various forms of experimentation, just like what it says in the book, I continued to try to control and enjoy my drinking. And what kind of happened was there were good times and there were bad times, but progressively I started seeing myself breaking rules around drinking that I told myself I would never do. You know, and it starts with, okay, well, you know, just once every now and then I'll do it, to, okay, well, you know, once a week's okay, and, but I'm never going to do it on school nights, or I'm never going to drink and drive, or I'm never going to do that, or I'm never going to do this. And then eventually, you know, when those situations would arise, I would think, well, oh, this is actually different than that because of this, you know, and I would come up with all these reasons why my rules didn't apply in this situation. And I mean, no one was like enforcing them but me, but I just, I kept, I wanted to drink, you know, I wanted to be a part of, and drinking kind of made that possible for me. And so the more I tried to be that person and live that life, actually, the more that I ended up secluded from my friends because it turns out that I didn't drink like they drank. You know, I wanted to drink a lot. I wanted to drink all the time. And when I was drinking, I was drinking to get drunk. And I didn't really mind whatever the consequences of that were. And I had to start hiding it from people. And now, obviously, being a high school student, I had to hide it from people from the beginning. You know, I had to hide it from my parents and I had to hide it from my teachers and my employers and all that kind of stuff. But pretty soon, I couldn't be honest with anyone anymore. And it got to the point where I couldn't tell anyone the whole truth because I couldn't even tell myself the whole truth. I didn't even know what it was anymore. And I started building for myself this world that I lived in that just wasn't true. You know, I started telling myself things about how I drank, who I was, what I did, what I didn't do that just weren't true anymore. But I, like it says in the book, I could no longer distinguish between the true and the false. And the alcoholic life that I built for myself seemed the only real one. Um, and so I didn't really know what to do. And so in the course of my drinking, I had a few friends get sober, go into the program, go to treatment. Sometimes it was a spin dry. They'd come back 30 days later and everything would be a little bit maybe better for them than it was when they went in. And some of them actually stayed sober. And some of them went to AA. And I remember thinking of those that did go to AA that, well, it's good that they got sober, but they probably really didn't need AA to do that. They could have done that on their own, you know. AA just made it easier for them or whatever. And I remember going to an AA meeting with one of them, and I was sitting in the rooms, and things had gotten pretty bad in my drinking by this point. You know, it had, it had become harder and harder to hide the way that I was drinking from the people around me. And the consequences, consequences of that drinking had become more and more pronounced in my life. And as I'm sitting in this AA meeting, you know, I'm listening to these people share, and they're talking about how their lives have gotten better since they stopped drinking. And they're talking about some of the things that they've gotten back. And, you know, one of the things that somebody said, and it's like one of the very few things that stands out to me is, you know, my, ga my dad lent me his credit card so I could go gas up his truck. And before, that is not something that ever would have happened. And I could totally identify with that because there was just no trust anymore for the way that I was with my family and the way that I was with my friends. There was no trust. And I thought, wow, that's, that's great. Like, I, you know, I wanted that. In that moment, I wanted that. But it was quickly removed from my mind by the thought that, but I could still drink tonight. You know, I don't need this. I, whatever this is, like, I'll figure it out. Now I know it's out there. Great. Thanks for the information. You know, now I'll go about my business. And um, so I tried various methods of getting sober. You know, I tried geographical cures. I tried moving out of the country. I tried, uh, you know, quit leaving school for a little while, taking a little break from that. You know, I tried a lot of different things. 
Um, and, you know, I tried religion and I tried this God thing, which I'm, I was really opposed to when I came in here. And, you know, I remember there was this moment where I went to church in the morning and it wasn't even service. I was just, I was there because I knew that I needed help and I, I knew that something was wrong. And I was sitting in the, in the pew and I was praying and I was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. You got to help me. I don't want to do what I'm about to do. And, um, and, you know, somebody came up to me, a neighbor of mine, actually, who I knew, and we talked for a while. And after that conversation, I felt a lot better. You know, it's like, okay, I'm going to go to confession. I'm going to clear all this stuff out of me. It's going to be fine. Everything's going to work out. And then I immediately left and forged a check and went and got loaded anyway. You know, and that was my attempts to get so That was the best that I could do was I would feel better for a little while, but it wouldn't be enough to keep me from going back out there. And so what finally happened was, you know, I ran out of options. I had no excuses left. I had nothing left. And I finally got asked the question, what do we do? What can we possibly do to help you? You know, and I said, I don't know. I need help. So I went to treatment, you know, and that, that was my last real fight was going to treatment. And I had picked out the place that let me smoke, you know, in the treatment facility. And I had picked out the place that looked the best and had the best success records. Like I was setting myself up to win without even really knowing it, right? And so I go there, and immediately I just get this, this idea that, you know, if I just do what they tell me to do, this could work out. You know, if I do everything that people tell me to do, and it doesn't work, then I can go back and say, okay, AA didn't work for me, treatment didn't work for me, and I have to find a different way to do it. But, you know, I was in that moment, I was completely willing to do whatever they wanted to do. Now, of course, nobody believed that I was actually willing to do whatever they wanted me to do. They thought that I was just trying to get out of there as fast as possible. And, you know, it didn't help that every time they'd call my parents to talk about how well I was doing, my parents would be like, well, he's probably lying, and he's probably manipulating you to try to get out of there, you know? And so nobody, I mean, nobody had any reason to believe anything that I said or anything that I did. And, you know, like I had done that to myself. You know, I was crushed by a self-imposed crisis that I couldn't postpone or evade that was my active alcoholism and what that did to my family. And so, you know, it got to the point where I realized, okay, nobody's going to believe me. Nobody, you know, people want to, to trust me, but they can't. So I just have to keep doing it. Um, and I remember, you know, it was about maybe a week or two in, and one of the counselors asked if I was really committed to doing whatever they told me to do. And I told them, yeah, I'll do whatever you guys asked me to do, you know, because I was already starting to feel a little bit better. And I realized that doing those things made me feel better. And so he's like, all right, I want you to cut all your hair off and shave your beard. And now at that particular point in my life, I didn't look as well-groomed as I do right now. And um, I had really long, scraggly hair, and I had this crazy goatee that was down to here, and I looked pretty terrible. Um, and I said, okay. You know, I did it. And I looked at myself in the mirror after that, after I was finished shaving, and it was the first, like, indication that something was different because I didn't recognize who was looking back at me. And things really started to change for me. The more that I did, the better I felt, the better my life got. And I just got to this place where, you know, I, I became completely willing. And now I still balk on a pretty regular basis at certain things because, you know, that crisis that I was in then isn't as pronounced now as it was, you know. But I told them that I would be willing to go to halfway. And I told them that I'd be willing to go to halfway. I just asked that they please don't send me anywhere cold. And so they sent me to Maine in, um, in November. And, you know, once again, it was me having absolutely no control over that situation. And now I really wanted to go home for Christmas to see my family. And I knew that if I fought tooth and nail, I could probably make it happen, but that I wasn't going to do that. And so what happened? I got a summons for a court date on the 20th of December, and I had to come home, and I was going to be home for five days, and I was going to be home for Christmas. You know, and it's like these things lined up in my life. And it seemed like the less that I fought the people in my life and things that were going on with me, the more things kind of just worked out. And so when I was home, I got a really amazing opportunity to see a bunch of my friends in a situation that at three months sober I definitely shouldn't have been in, which was at a party where people are drinking and doing drugs. And I'm there, you know, sober, like not really sure what's going on, kind of dazed, but like sober, doing a program, you know, working the stuff. And at the end of that night, I had a couple of them reach out to me and say that they wanted to change their life the way that I had changed mine. And so now I had a couple of friends who got sober and are still sober today as a result of me being there. And, you know, 
I don't know of any other like explanation. There was no reason for me to be there. I shouldn't have been there. You know, I remember telling my counselors that I went to this party and they were like, what are you thinking? You know, and it was, but as a result of me just being there, not even saying anything to them, not throwing the big book at them, not telling them how great AA was and how great my life was, just being there, I showed enough of a change in who I was as a person that other people wanted what I had at that moment. And that contact with those people in my early sobriety made a huge difference because, you know, talking to someone who's a day sober when you've got three or four months and they're asking you, does this obsession ever go away? You know, am I ever not going to think about drinking and drugging 24 hours a day? And I could tell them that I didn't anymore. And that wasn't, that didn't used to be the case for me. It used to be really hard for me to go any period of time without thinking about taking a drink. But I didn't feel that way anymore. And I could look back and think, there's been a change as a result of what I'm doing. And so I got to Portland, and I did the things that people told me to do, which there's a big laundry list. You know, it's get a sponsor, work the steps, get a home group, get a service position, work with others, clean house. You know, it just goes on and on and on. But I tried to do as much of it as I could, um, and I didn't do it all perfectly. But I got a sponsor who had a lot of time, and he took me through the steps, and I did the best that I could in that first run through the steps, and I've done them since, and I will continue to do them, hopefully, forever, because the more I'm in this program, the more it gets revealed to me about who I am and the causes and conditions that led to my drinking. And so, like, my biggest thing was I just did things, and it worked out for me. You know, I went early to meetings, I set up chairs. I went early to meetings, I made coffee. I didn't have anything else to do. I didn't have a job, I didn't go to school. I just went two, three meetings a day. I hung out with people in sobriety because I didn't know anyone else. I lived in a sober house. I was surrounded by men in sobriety. And, you know, it worked for me because, you know, at a year sober, I got the opportunity to come back home, to finish my undergraduate degree, to actually be present in my life and the lives of the people around me. And I think that the biggest thing that I got was I got to come home and, you know, live in my parents' house and have them trust me. I got to say, hey, I'm going to a meeting. I'll be back in a couple of hours and not have them be worried about if I was still alive, if I was going to come back, or if they were going to get a phone call from the cops or from the morgue, or from the hospital that something had happened to me, because that was the life that I was living before. And, you know, that is a total, like, 180-degree change that I was not able to accomplish on my own. But the only thing that I was able to do was in that instant was to be willing. And as long as I continue to have that willingness in my life, I think that I can continue to change and continue to grow in this program. And so the biggest thing for me that I can possibly say is just be willing to do something different. And today, what that looks like for me is being uncomfortable for the past couple of weeks and not really being sure why. And realizing that when I came to Seattle, I didn't immediately jump into the fellowship that I had in Maine because I was looking for the main meeting that existed in Seattle, and there wasn't one. And you guys were doing AA wrong. And, you know, this whole not raising your hands thing to talk, like, how could that possibly work? Like, it's a bunch of alcoholics trying to talk at a meeting without anyone pointing at you and telling you, okay, you can talk now, because that's how it was for me. And so I just thought everything was wrong here, you know. But, you know, you guys stayed sober. And you guys did this program. And the little things that were the differences that I saw really made it hard for me to jump in with both feet. But that didn't mean that I didn't know what to do. It just took me getting a sponsor, telling him, hey, I'm in pain. I'm crushed by a self-imposed crisis. I can't postpone or evade. And him telling me, have you called anyone in the program this week? Have you sat down with another alcoholic for coffee and just talked? You know, have you done anything that you did in your first year of sobriety? And I was like, well, I haven't drank. He's like, that's a good start. You know, but I have to continue to do more. And so what that looks like for me today is calling other people, is trying to be of service wherever I am, and trying to remember that, like, I still have a long way to go in this program, even if I have three years, that I have a lot to learn, and I continue to learn every day as long as I'm willing. So thanks for letting me share today. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.